The topic of this edition of Healthy Living is a very important one. The topic is suicide. Stay with us and we're going to talk about it. According to data from 2004, more than 32,000 Americans die by suicide each year. That's one every 16 minutes. Over 800,000 attempt suicide each year. That's one every 39 seconds. It's the 11th leading cause of death in the United States. Here to help me talk about these startling numbers, I have with me Dr. David Meyer, a psychiatrist in town. I have two clinical practitioners. I have Jennifer, Jennifer Villarreal and Joyce Ray, and I have our own WKCTC nursing professor, Connie Heflin. Thank you all for joining me. I appreciate it. Okay. Let's just start out, each of you, just telling me a little bit about yourselves and what got you into what you're doing today. I uh, moved to Paducah in uh, 1986 uh, and went into private practice in adult psychiatry. Uh, prior to that, I was in Lexington in practice, and prior to that, Navy for a while. And um, you know, my interest is general adult psychiatry, uh, various, various uh, spanning quite a few different diagnostic areas, but especially depression. All right, Jennifer? And I'm right now at Four Rivers Behavioral Health working with children ages 5 to 18. And I've worked in various counseling agencies in the area here as well as in California. Great. Joyce? And uh, I began my nursing career at um, PCC, graduated in 1994, went on to get my BSN. And um, mental health's always interested me. This is my 25th year at the college, and uh, I'm a graduate of this program, and when I obtained my master's degree, my clinical area of specialty was psych, mental health, and I have work experience in the psychiatric unit at Lourdes Hospital. And uh, so for all this time, this is the subject area that I've taught. Mm. Right. well, thank you again for joining me. Mm. I'm going to go over the, the statistics again. Uh, one every 16 minutes, one person every 16 minutes dies by suicide. That's really scary. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize until I started doing research for this show really how prevalent it is. So how common is it in our area? Anybody want to talk about that? Is it, do you see, is it, is it something in our area, that, in our region? Absolutely, and unfortunately all the time. And no matter how common or uncommon the act of suicide is, it still strikes very hard on families, survivors. Uh, it's, it's a tragedy of huge proportion. Um, actually, I don't know what the McCracken County statistics run, but as a state, we're actually in, uh, we're ranked around 16th, which uh, certainly puts us in the top half in terms of the frequency of suicide and puts us slightly above the national average. Uh, the statistics on suicide are usually expressed in uh, deaths per 100,000. Mm -hmm. Nationally, the, the rate is uh, around 11 or 12 per 100,000, and Kentucky, I suppose, would be somewhat above that. In 2004, we were, I believe, almost 14, 13, just ah, about 13 so in 2004. Even, ah. But I don't know what the numbers are now because all that I could find was from 2004 or 2005. Um, but I want to talk about what the major causes are of suicide, and we'll start out with you, Dr. Yeah, Murray. if I could start. One thing that has become very clear over the years that uh, persons who commit suicide or, or kill themselves intentionally almost always have a psychiatric diagnosis, and it's not unusual for them to have more than one psychiatric diagnosis. And the, the diagnoses that we know are associated with, with uh, suicide are uh, major depression, uh, bipolar disorder, uh, patients who have uh, either they're in the midst of a, of a major depressive episode or what we call a mixed or agitated episode. Um, schizophrenia is associated mm -hmm. with higher incidence of, of suicide, especially it seems early in the course of illness, the younger mm -hmm. persons uh, early, early on. Um, there are other uh, as well, certainly uh, chemical dependency. 
um, alcohol, drugs of all sorts, and this is often combined with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, or depression. Um, certain eating disorders, panic disorders, these are associated with an increased frequency at least of suicide attempts, if not completions. And then finally, um, uh, suicide appears to be associated f more frequently with persons of certain personality disorders, especially what's called borderline personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. So, and what is that exactly? Well, I know it's probably that's a put long you on the topic spot. for a short. I'll try a short answer. First, borderline personality disorder appears to be a, a, a clustering of symptoms which involve intense unstable interpersonal relationships, uh, intense mood swings, um, risk of acting out, uh, what we mean by acting out, uh, uh, intentional self-harm. Uh, so people with borderline personality are often in the midst of emotional turmoil, often interpersonally, and in that context are at high risk of harming themselves. And we must not believe that cutting wrists or scratching wrists is trivial because people who do this type of behavior are at higher risk of completing or killing themselves later on. We have to take that seriously. Now, quickly, antisocial personality, uh, they're the folks, unfortunately, who populate our prisons. Uh, they're individuals who are frequently in conflict with the laws and mores of our society, um, often have a drinking or drug problem, and again, have a higher risk of suicide. Mm -hmm. So some of the others that that you've heard of, post-traumatic stress disorder, postpartum depression, um, and then life experiences. They tie in with, with these. Those, yes. These, um, and post-traumatic stress is considered one of the anxiety disorders. Okay. And you talked about how it, some of the younger ones have a harder time in, in when they start having these uh, mental disorders, they're younger, and they have a harder time cope, excuse me, coping with them. Do you see that in your, in your work, Jennifer, that the younger ones, they just, they have a harder time coping than, than adults. They just it's true, they, they don't have the life experience that adults have had that we learn to deal with stress in different ways and to develop positive coping skills and things like that. And especially with teenagers is where we see some of the substance abuse coming in because they're trying to deal with these feelings that they're having by self-medicating, you know, helping themselves feel better but just not in a positive way. So sometimes they might feel bad, they have all of this stress, or they may have some of these disorders that you mm -hmm. talked about, and the substance abuse is a way of trying to cover that up. And mm -hmm. then, it, then that adds another factor and to I, their... I think uh, a lot of times with the kids with a history of abuse of some sort mm -hmm. that they've grown up through that, mm -hmm. then they have the suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Joyce, one of the questions that you provided for me, we've talked about all the disorders and, and the youth, but who is greatest at risk for the suicide? Uh, the greatest at risk is the elderly, actually. And uh, white, non-Hispanic males are the highest risk, mm -hmm. with uh, six times greater than the national average, actually. Um, some of that's due to the isolation that they feel. You know, they've lost their life skill, you know, they're uh, maybe even been placed in a, you know, out of their home environment. Some I've read uh, don't want to be a burden. Right. Mm -hmm. They choose because right. I'd rather not live anymore if I'm going to be a burden right. to my family members. Mm -hmm. They feel hopeless and, and helpless, actually. And also there's data that uh, the elderly often do not have the same access to treatment for whatever reason, whether it be the denial of their de depression, they often couch it in other terms, uh, or simply just a lack of access. Uh, so it's also a very undertreated population. Mm -hmm. the elderly. And, and I, sometimes they can't afford, they can't work anymore, so they can't yeah. afford medications that they may need. Exactly right. I think the medications are a big part of that. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Being able to afford it, that's something that I really don't have to have for my physical body, so I won't take that that type of thing. So it's, um, it's a catch-22 because they need it, but then, then they need to eat. Mm -hmm. So sometimes That's they right. choose the, you know, to eat instead of taking the medications right. that they need. One of the statistics I had was 90% of suicides are from untreated depression. Is that, is that true? Would you think that's an accurate figure? That's probably uh, 
fairly accurate. Um, um, the, uh, the fact is that some people do not uh, access mental health uh, workers or psychiatrists or even family doctors because mm -hmm. of the stigma, possible yeah. stigma associated with depression or as we said maybe economic factors mm -hmm. that uh, especially with my field uh, for some reason people often feel that they can't afford you know that level of care but in fact there are many avenues where it does make it affordable mental health centers mm -hmm. throughout the region and all uh, yeah what are other reasons besides that they just don't think they need to see a psychiatrist that they wouldn't seek treatment I mean there is a stigma that is attached to mental illness that people do not want to talk about and if you, anybody can address just the stigma that goes along with particularly with the youth, nobody, nobody wants to, to say that there's something wrong with them, particularly when they're young. They have such mm -hmm. an invincible attitude about themselves anyway. Mm -hmm. um, describe, you know, t talk about a little bit of the stigma that people, the youth maybe have mm -hmm. to deal with or, or even from, you know, how you do from a nursing perspective. I've had several children come in to the agency and Four Rivers Children's Section is called the Center for Specialized Children's Services and they came in asking, does this mean that I'm special, specialized because they have that stigma of special education and things mm -hmm. like that and so they're even coming in for services thinking that that's creating that um, is and if definitely anybody there. Finds out, yes. If my friends find out, then I'm even worse than when I started. Because if they're making fun of me for, for one reason or another, and mm -hmm. one of the things I had is that it's the 11th leading cause of death in the United States, but it's the third leading cause mm -hmm. in youth of America. Mm -hmm. Third. That's a big jump. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things, bullying, is probably a big thing that mm -hmm. you hear. Mm -hmm. um, Frequently. Bullying. And, and just the, of growing up, I mean, how many of you had acne when you grew up? Or how many of you were devastated and your heart was broken by your your love of your life when you were 11 or 12 mm -hmm. or 14. And some people can't cope with that. And so Dr. Meyer, I mean, how do you, how do, how do the youth, how would you address that? I mean. Well, I might say been there, done that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all go through these things. We all have, uh, we all have uh, certain shortcomings that seem huge at the time, but in, as we gain perspective over time that we, uh, we see uh, that these are not the huge things that uh, they, we thought they were. Uh, I wear contact lenses, I used to wear thick glasses, right. you know, and all this, and, uh, uh, and so there are things that really hurt. And, and children who don't, have, uh, don't receive good self-esteem at home and who are bullied are really those at high risk, I think, mm -hmm. uh, for suicide these days. Um, you know the the youth see their their see their problems as um, just uh, uh, interminable, um, inescapable, um, and intolerable. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, that those three eyes are used uh, in the literature about the three eyes mm -hmm. of suicidal thinking. Uh, and the idea of intervention and treatment is to help them change their perspective. As, as a counselor, do you have to be careful when you talk to them because they don't really want to hear that? You know, they don't, they, I, I've just totally lost my train of thought, so I'm going to have to regroup here. But well, to talk about. Let me say something yeah. then about the stigma back to that. Um, as far as the training of nurses, I think that's basic in, in terms of understanding your own feelings and attitudes toward what is mental illness, what is depression, suicidal thoughts. Uh, a lot of that has to do too, I think, with the culture of where you live. Uh, if you're a adult or adolescent in Western Kentucky, yes, there's a stigma. Mm -hmm. I think less so now than there used to be. I agree. But I, I think you'd find if you lived in uh, on one of the coasts, you know, you lived in uh, uh, New York, Los Angeles, New Orleans. It might be a badge of honor to be seen by a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Mm -hmm. So it really there is a difference there as far as uh, a cultural belief. I think around here we've come a long way. I feel like mm -hmm. in the years that I've been teaching, but I think that's part of uh, what the nursing uh, responsibility is: is to teach 
about uh, what is mental illness, what is mental health, to get out there in the schools uh, with different community groups and do that teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's something that the students, it's really funny when you're in the classroom with them and, and we talk about uh, depression, we go through bipolar disorder, the, all of that. Then we get to the suicide part and it's very quiet. And usually there's several in the class that have been affected by that, as you talked about, with so many connections to that. But it's good to talk about it, and it's good to get it out in the open. Mm -hmm. well, well, the point I, that I was, was um, regrouping while you were answering it, thank you, is that um, I have forgotten what it is like to be 13 years old. I've forgotten that when I don't make good grades, that that can be devastating to kids and now you know I'm, I'm an adult and those things aren't really important to me anymore and so I have an 11 year old daughter oh, excuse me <laughs> I have an almost 13 year old daughter she's really gonna get me for that um, that you know the things that she comes home and talks about seem they seem trivial to me mm -hmm. but it's scary that if I trivialize those things what that might mean for her mm -hmm. so how do you as as counselors even if it's not a child even if it's an adult, how do you not trivialize things that to me seem, seem silly? I think that you really have to listen to what they're telling you mm -hmm. and see how that and their belief system regarding what is going on, how that's impacting them as, as a person because everybody is impacted by different things differently. And again, as you, th as you said, it kind of seems like they're over impacted at times, but just listening and being aware of the issues going on in their life, I think is very important. I think that is the number one thing, yeah. even with the elderly, listening to what they're saying to you because mm -hmm. they feel like no one does listen to them. And their, their desire is to have someone speak to them. I mean, listen to them is, you know, while they're speaking and um, uh, being genuine in it. Well, I have a mother, my mother is 74 years old and she lives with me. And you f when they get older, sometimes you forget that they were young and youthful at one time and you don't listen to them. Mm -hmm. They don't, you're like, oh yeah, mom, whatever. Okay, fine. And then you feel bad because they're like, I'm important too. Mm -hmm. I'm just, so you're, you have the kids who feel like they're not listened to and the, the elderly who aren't That's listened right. to. And so it's a tough situation mm -hmm. to, to be in. Let's, let's go on to the warning signs because there are, there are a plethora of warning signs. Yes, there are. And uh, just go over a few of those, anyone? Well, the first warning sign I would bring up is unremitting depression, uh, mm -hmm. a sad mood. Um, uh, withdrawal, mm -hmm. um, a lot of negative self-talk, um, hopeless, hopeless statements um, would be a big part of what I would look for. Hopeless statement being something that maybe one of you have heard. <sighs> hopeless would be, I don't think I'm ever going to get better. Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. probably, that's probably one of the most common statements I hear in my practice. And, I don't uh, think I'm ever going to get better. I don't think I'm ever going to get better. Or I'm always going to feel this mm -hmm. way. Yeah, the similar. Mm -hmm. It's never going to get any better. It's never never going to get any better. Yeah, that's the one I tackle a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. And the other warning signs? Um, giving away personal yes. belongings, mm -hmm. uh, especially of a child, is something that's uh, that they value very much. Um, I don't know what the games are nowadays, but an iPod, for example, give that to a friend. Mm -hmm. And you always have to look at those symptoms within the context of the mm -hmm. big picture. Right. And I try to say that to the students uh -huh. because they're right. going, oh, this might identify my right. son Teenager. or daughter. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Visiting friends, saying goodbye. Visiting family, friends, saying goodbye. You know, just kind of, you know, it's not, uh, it's not Christmas, you know, mm -hmm. it's uh, April. Actually, uh, most people think winter months are the most common months for suicide. They're not, actually. It's April, June, and July. Mm -hmm. Really? So yes. <laughs> they could kind of throw someone off. Mm -hmm. April, yeah. June, and July. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes writing about it. You, m you may have a, a youth that is writing notes. You know, I just want to kill myself. I just want to die. Know. And youth can be angry yeah. too. They mm -hmm. can be actually show more anger than mm -hmm. sadness. Right. And yes. that really throws you off and it's kind of off too. Because isn't that too, typical of some teenagers? Because you <laughs> don't, yeah. Yes. And, but you really, it's really hard to deal with. You, mm -hmm. A person would Where, almost rather not go there. How do you know there. where the line is? How, 
How do you know? Because, about for instance, and youth? What, the anger. For instance, oh. you know, teenagers get angry. Teenagers are emotional. Um, they go in their room and they want to be alone and listen to their music for periods of time. And, and some of that is probably normal. But how, you know, from someone who, what do I look for? How do I know when that's not normal anymore? I think you really want to kind of look at the clustering of the symptoms and having several of the symptoms really that are severe enough and significant enough that's really making the impact on their lives. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And especially, you know, even their friends will say they don't have that same closeness, they don't have that same relationship. Mm -hmm. And of course, at their age, they're hopefully they're all going to school. Mm -hmm. And you, what you see a drop in school performance. Yes. And of course, you think of drugs, but you also think of depression. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks of drugs, mm -hmm. but, but depression is a, another thing that happens all the time. Mm -hmm. They may lose interest in something that once just really excited them, yeah. and all of a sudden it's just mm -hmm. like, oh, I could care less, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that is, that's another sign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like you said, you, one in itself may mean something, but it's mm -hmm. more of it's a cluster yes. right. if they mm -hmm. happen. Um, what, some of the things we talked about, the youth and, and the elderly, even what interested them once doesn't interest them anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but what about people in, in, that are, that are middle-aged, um, that they have to work every day, uh, job performance, things like that? Um, what, are, what things should we look for? Divorce. Some of the other mm -hmm. the yes. things that the life experiences, divorce, um, yeah. if s sexual abuse, those mm -hmm. types of things that can really affect people. Um, you know, how do we, how do, what kind of symptoms do you look for? Because I can see in youth, okay, mm -hmm. all right, I know yeah, to what well. to look for, maybe in the elderly, mm -hmm. but in the, the more middle aged population. We still have our guidelines uh, mm -hmm. from the, we all use a DSM-3, 4, excuse me, TR, I'm, I'm dating <laughs> yes. myself here. The okay. three's from the 80s. Yeah. So we're on, we're on DSM-4 TR, and what yes. that is, it's a list of symptom criteria for different illnesses, and we still have that for middle mm -hmm. age. And, the, and depression is more alike than dissimilar as we look from youth to middle age mm -hmm. to, to elderly. We have different stresses that impinge on us, but the illness, the the final common denominator is really quite similar, and we have mm -hmm. to look for all that. You know, functional impairment, I think, is, the, is a real key, that these symptoms come together and cause real functional impairment mm -hmm. in daily life. See that quite frequently in the, in the emergency room, people coming through saying, I can no longer do my work at home. I, I can't mm -hmm. seem to concentrate at work. Um, is, that, is that a trigger for you? Is that uh, it, something that it, immediately you think, okay. Trigger for depression. Yeah, right. yeah. definitely for depression. If it's a change, see, from their usual functioning level. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. and it seems like one thing leads to another, you know, sometimes. And so you're talking and, and talking to them and asking them what it is that's bothering them. You know, what stressors have happened in your life recently that have caused you to feel helpless and hopeless and things such as that leads into that. Because even if it's not helpless and hopeless, that's what they're believing and they get caught in this cognitive circle of, of it gets worse and worse and worse yes. and they're... So and it I, just, it grows. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. and I think in any age group, you were talking about kids and then the middle age, but also the elderly, just to have a critical ear to what is being said. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be a statement said that you might uh, like from a, a child, a teenager, uh, just kind of brush off that maybe within the context of the other symptoms means something as far as mm -hmm. self-harm potential. So uh, I think, you know, listening to what is being said is, is important. Uh, getting back to stress and depression, I do want to add something. I think uh, depression can also occur in a non-stressful context. Yes. Um, the way I look at depression is it's the coming together of stress and genetic vulnerability. Now, if you look at it like a scale, if you have a ton of genetic vulnerability, and if you've had several episodes of depression, over time, the depression can kindle itself without stress. So I don't think all the time, especially in middle age, we talk about her later in life, mm -hmm. if a person has had a history of several depressions, there may not be any unusual stress going on, and it has a spontaneity about it that it may be hard to understand, but conceivably a person could be depressed and suicidal 
at that point in their lives without some life overbearing stressor. life stressor. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a it's kind of like it's the a spark. Multi, the, 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 the yeah, depression is the spark, and then eventually it, you don't even need that. It can present in many many, many different, different ways. ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the question that, that, that you just brought up was genetic vulnera yes. vulnerability. Yes. That was easier for you to say than it was that for well, me. I'm used to saying <laughs> <laughs> But is, is it an inherited thing? I mean... It there are clues that it can, it is inherited. Number one, we know from family studies, unfortunately, that suicidality can run in families. Mm -hmm. And when I take a family history on a new patient, I definitely get a red flag feeling when I hear that there has been a suicide in the family. Mm -hmm. Now what does that mean genetically? Um, they've done studies that have shown that in, um, sadly, in suicide victims, uh, they have done a chemical analysis of their uh, spinal fluid and they found that these victims have a low level of serotonin, serotonin metabolites in their spinal fluid especially those who have used violent means of suicide, shooting, hanging, such. Mm -hmm. um, there are other clues that are even more recent uh, that uh, indicate that there may be structural differences in receptor sites or the way the transmitters are manufactured, enzyme levels, uh, and so on. So there's clearly genetic vulnerability. Um, and again, a person with high genetic vulnerability needs a minimum of stress mm -hmm. to trigger the illness. Uh, right. A person with low vulnerability, yes, they have the capacity, like Katrina, we talk about PTSD mm -hmm. and depression, you know, a horrendous stress like mm -hmm. that can also uh, precipitate depression in people who otherwise would be pretty resilient. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going we're gonna to take a break here in just a second, but I want to I move on to the family members that are survived mm -hmm. by those that commit suicide. And I found several stories online, and um, a lot of them started out kind of the same, Dr. Meyer, and, and, and that they were all intelligent and handsome and smart and athletic, and they just couldn't believe then, then what happened to them. It was almost like these warning signs that you talked about just blindsided the parents and the family. They just did not see it coming. And so that's scary for me, that you talk about these things, and while we're sitting here, it makes perfect sense. Okay, I'm going to look for these things that you just told me about. But so often, they're missed. And that's really why I want to do this show. I, I want people to really be aware of what the warning signs are and what the symptoms are. Um, and this is just one story, and then we'll go to break and talk about that. It says, Daniel Glover was a handsome, intelligent, outgoing, fun, sensitive, caring, and popular young man gifted athlete, uh, the fastest sprinter on his sophomore track team. Um, his athletic ability put him in a class by himself and made him a true sports superstar. Um, he was no doubt a spectacular athlete, seemed to have everything going for him. But the most important thing he had was, a, was his family. Um, he had several good friends, all of, all of the things that you think a well-adjusted person would have. Um, and then it says, but Daniel had a very difficult sophomore year in high school. A few challenging issues and his life caused him to become depressed. And on April 18, 2007, Daniel died by suicide. He was 16 years old. And his father said, our lives were changed forever that day. And my family and I miss him dearly. I will love him until the day I die. Mm -hmm. So uh, stay with us. We'll be right back, and we're going to talk about how family and friends are affected when someone they love commits suicide. Stay with us. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to the show. 
Uh, the topic of this edition of Healthy Living, again, is suicide and learning more about it, becoming aware of it, and trying to prevent it. Um, I want to go over some of the data that I uh, talked about at the beginning of the show. More than 32,000 Americans die each year from suicide, one every 16 minutes. Over 800,000 attempt to commit suicide, one every 39 seconds. And um, again, just to uh, introduce my panel again, Dr. David Meyer, psychiatrist here in town, two clinical practitioners. I have Jennifer Villarreal, Joyce Ray, and our WKCTC nursing instructor, Connie Heflin. Um, again, those numbers are very scary. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to talk about in this segment about the family and those that are left behind. Um, if, uh, like the statistics say, one uh, in every 16 minutes, uh, the numbers that I came up with said that on average, um, every time someone commits suicide, six other people are intimately affected. So if that's true, then every 16 minutes, six other new survivors are created. Hmm. And that's a very staggering statistic for me because, you know, it's when people do that, I'm not sure, you know, Dr. Meyer, that they're in mentally they're depressed or they have the disorders or they they just can't see any way out they're not thinking about their loved ones and their friends mm -hmm. and how do we deal with the family and friends how does suicide affect them how does it change them well I think mostly it's a guilt feeling I should have recognized what was going on I should have seen some signs um, I have failed this member of my family. And it's just not always that way. So. Mm -hmm. And suicide is such a traumatic event that not only are they going through the typical grief stages, but they're pronounced in something such as this. We, we see a lot of children coming in um, after a family member has committed suicide, something like that, with with similar feelings and, and statements regarding death and, mm -hmm. and things such as that. I bet they feel abandoned. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably, people probably go through a lot of different stages, including anger, mm -hmm. you know, feeling anger toward that person. Um, mm -hmm. Oh my, what else? Uh, the, for a, 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 a family who's lost a child or a teenager, uh, uh, mourning the unfulfilled potential, you know, no high school graduation, no college, no marriage, no grandchildren. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 a, it's a it's the deepest heartbreak I think a person can experience. Mm -hmm. Because, like you said, Jennifer, on top of losing the person that you love, to lose them in such a way for them to take their own life adds such a different dimension to that. It breaks my heart. I mean, and yeah. I, I haven't experienced it you know, from anyone close to me. I only have, you know, some friends that have experienced it. And it breaks my heart for them because it's bad enough to lose someone, mm -hmm. but then to deal with the grief and the, the guilt that you feel because all of the warning mm -hmm. signs that we talked about, they didn't see. And I think there is a stigma for losing the family member that way that then the survivors don't want to talk about. Some choose just to close that off. Right. and not discuss it, whereas if you lost a family member to cancer or another illness, it's looked at as differently. Well, because on top of that, there's the stigma with that, but there is the stigma that we talked about in the first segment about mental illness. And so they don't want people to perceive their child, their brother, their mother, their father as being mentally ill. Even after they've lost someone like that, even they may be withdrawn not to let people know that that their loved one was mentally ill for fear that they might think bad about them and they're gone now. Mm -hmm. And to protect them, mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. is that something that you know you hear with children or, or with adults oh. that you talk to? They don't want to talk about it because they don't want people to think there's something wrong with them or there was something wrong with the people that they love that committed suicide. Well, speaking from personal experience, not from clinical, that is true. You don't want to have to talk about it you don't want other people thinking that the one that you loved was crazy, so to speak, not in their right mind. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's very difficult. You do feel the guilt because you don't see the warning signs. You see it after the fact, not before the fact, because you're not looking for it. And I say, speaking from experience, I can say that. And, and don't you want to not see it? Mm. I don't want to think that someone I love is going to do that. So I don't want to see the signs. Mm. So what would you say to someone who doesn't want to see the signs? Because they don't want to deal with that. And, and I would think, oh, I, I would want to explain that away. You know, my daughter, she, she's just, you know, she's just a teenager. She's hormonal. She's going in a room, locking herself in a room. She's angry. She's, you know, but, but it's not anything that bad. Mm -hmm. What would you say to someone? I mean, wh what advice would you give about the warning signs not to ignore? I say take them very seriously. Mm -hmm. You know, look at what's going on around you. Yeah. We do get wrapped up in our own lives, and we, we don't see the needs of others sometimes. Mm -hmm. But look, look around you. Be proactive and look on purpose. Mm -hmm. look try, on to, purpose. Uh, try to show something objective. She was an A and B student, now she's making D's. Yeah. Hello. Right. There's something there. If you can get, yeah, if you can get mm -hmm. as objective as possible. Mm -hmm. Kind of an intervention, I think. Mm -hmm. There is a concept, especially associated with the elderly, and you all can comment on this. Um, I didn't uh, put this on my list of things to talk about, but the concept of rational suicide, that that is uh, the person is not mentally ill upon making that decision to kill him or herself. Um, I don't know, that's an ethical discussion, mm -hmm. but um, I don't know, what do you all think? Um, to me, uh, from what I've read, the phenomenon is less common than we think. Um, we've already talked about how depression can slip by. You know, even, mm -hmm. even doctors miss that. They don't ask and so on, let alone family. Uh, depression is easy to slip by. Um, if you look at a particular illness, if you say you look at uh, uh, cancer, and I, I'm almost certain on this, the people with cancer, if you look at their suicide rates, they actually are not that high at all. There's not an increased rate of suicide in cancer people, cancer patients. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think we have to be uh, careful. I think that, um, especially when some people use that as a justification for, for killing themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, if I were told, if I ran, had a blood test and it proved that I was going to have Huntington's chorea and die a terrible death, that's one thing. But again, that's a pretty uncommon thing. I, I think mm -hmm. more than a few of us might struggle with that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we have to ask, how would that affect my children? How would that affect that's my right. wife or my husband? How would that affect, you know, everyone? Mm -hmm. So we have to, that's, that's Those not Those type easy. of things would change everything. Because I'm, I'm not, forever, because I'm not always going to be this healthy, strong 38-year-old woman. I'm going to possibly get Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease or those things and I don't want my children to have to take care of me. So what my thoughts might be when I'm 75 are totally different. Well maybe they really don't mind taking care of you and maybe they think that you changed 5,000 diapers and now it's now it's our turn to help you. Mm -hmm. I mean it's you just it's a very eth complex issue it is. mm -hmm. and it's easy to simplify and it, it ain't. What type of resources do we have here uh, available locally for family and friends um, who have um, lost someone to suicide? What type of resources do we have available? We have a suicide support group in the area, and, and we have and we have um, NAMI, mm -hmm. which is you know a, it's a mental he mental mm -hmm. illness That's group. Right. But I would think that they also have us. I think they have a support group. We have Zach's mm -hmm. Hope, which we're going to be talking about. Yes. We are going to do another mm -hmm. show, mm -hmm. a part two of this um, this topic, and mm -hmm. and they have some prevention and probably some support mm -hmm. to help people. Um, can we prevent it? Can we stop it? I've read, and I agree, the best way to prevent to, pre uh, to prevent suicide is to treat depression appropriately mm -hmm. and aggressively. Mm -hmm. That's my. Well, I, I have a friend, and she said that my loved one did not die by suicide. My loved one died by depression. Mm -hmm. That's what killed my loved one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was very profound. Yes. And that's another. That's one reason why we're doing this show because it touched me. 
to think that. It wasn't that this person, you know, killed themselves because, you know, there is that stigma we talked about, mm -hmm. but they were so depressed they couldn't see past it. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so... That's right. um, their medication management, their mm -hmm. psychotherapy, um, the combination is excellent, uh, mm -hmm. and it's all available. How do you, talking about medications, how do you know when someone needs medication? How do you know when, when talking is not enough? I mean, I guess that's just... Well, in, in psychiatry and other, in a, the helping fields, we, we talk about levels of depression, um, mild, moderate, or severe, and as a rule of thumb. I think that people with mild depression can op opt for psychotherapy. Some people may opt for medication. It can, medication can help in mild depression. Uh, as you move up the scale, moderately depressed individuals and severely depressed individuals, generally, generally medication is indicated, at least for a period of time. And I think ideally, uh, for some people, for many people, uh, counseling as well. Certainly for severe depression, medication is mandatory. Okay, um, here, here's a question for you, and this is another ethical dilemma, I'm sure. Okay. You have a grown man, grown woman. They need medication, but they won't take it. What do you do? What can you do? Is there anything? That's a very tough... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Gentle persuasion. <laughs> I don't know. Um, because with children, you, know, you can make them take it. With elderly, yeah. you can sneak it in their pudding. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can do yeah. those things. But with your, <laughs> your, your husband, your wife, who are very stubborn, and they just, or, or they get to a point in their mental illness where the medication has done what it is supposed to do, and they no longer feel like they need it, and then they stop taking it. That's a large concern. Education. education is very important and it's very important for the physician who's prescribing to educate the person mm -hmm. about the stages of treatment of depression and it does require a maintenance period otherwise the risk of relapse is huge but you what you have brought up is a is a very a great dilemma you know in our our laws say if a person is in immediate danger to self or to mm -hmm. others or different states have different criteria you can do something I mean mm -hmm. you can dial 911 and have, make things happen. Mm -hmm. But for the person who's in the middle, it's very difficult. Um, I was talking about intervention type of thing. Uh, uh, maybe something like that may, might be effective with a professional, mm -hmm. with professional assistance. Kind of like the TV show. Leaving pamphlets and brochures mm -hmm. around, maybe. I don't know. But there are some, there, there are some good things on DVD now. and and available okay. mm -hmm. that, maybe at that the could library, be helpful. Maybe at your public yeah. library you could um, go check into those but, things. But granted, it's a difficult, uh, it can be a difficult situation. And uh, anybody who's listening and is in that position, I urge them to consider treatment mm -hmm. because it is helpful. And sometimes it helps to hear it from somebody else besides your loved one. It helps to hear it because, oh, they're just saying that, they're just mad because I'm not doing what they want me to anymore. But it helps to hear it from someone else. Mm -hmm to help put it into perspective of what may be happening with mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And does it, uh, another one of the, the things that I hear, uh, people who have depression or they have anxiety, and they say, I am not taking any medicine for, for this because I'm stronger than that. Right. I am stronger than that, and I am not weak. I can do this by myself. What would you say? It doesn't have anything to do with strength or weakness. Mm -hmm. I agree. It does not. Uh, think of people like Abraham Lincoln who were depressed. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, mm -hmm. yes. That, in fact, a whole book has been written on his depression. You're too old. It's a great book. Uh, Winston Churchill was depressed. Mm -hmm. These are not weak people. Mm -hmm. The list goes on. <laughs> the list goes the on. The list goes on and on. Okay, he here's the next thing. Some of the things that we said. I want to, um, again, go over the warning signs and the symptoms mm -hmm. before, before I go in, into these next questions. Again, what are the warning signs that we are to look for, whether it's from 5 to 18, elderly, or middle-aged? Depression. Uh, either Go, yes. sadness okay. or, or younger, maybe anger, irritability, irritability. increased mm -hmm. irritability. What about eating? They don't eat. They, they don't either more. over or under mm -hmm. eat. Uh, okay. mm -hmm. Young tend to over. It, it varies, though. Sleep disturbance, mm -hmm. Withdrawal uh, loss of energy, loss of interest, loss of pleasure. Withdrawing from... Withdrawing. 
poor concentration, mm -hmm. trouble studying. If you're giving younger. away of personal mm -hmm. uh, of mm -hmm. valued mm -hmm. items, yeah, that's when it gets really scary. Yeah, talking that's when about you start. that's those a really the, scary one. If they those start are giving the warning things away. signs of suicide. suicide. Yeah, we established yeah. the diagnosis of depression, mm -hmm. you know, and then we look exactly. for the other things mm -hmm. that the real scary stuff that people. And the real Sometimes scary stuff, do. giving away of things, giving saying away goodbyes, things, saying goodbyes. What, writing the notes. Mm -hmm. yes. Elderly may not be mm -hmm. taking their medications, yeah. just purposefully not. They may falling. write their wheels out, you know, rechange re everything. You lots know, of negative talk. Down. Yes. Mm -hmm. and lots a lot of, of hopeless negative type talk, mm -hmm. a lot of sarcastic gallows humor stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and discussion the, the of death. Discussion yeah. of death. Talking about dying. Mm -hmm. Talking about dying. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some of the things, I, I can't take this anymore. I don't want to yes. deal with this pain anymore. That pain thing, the, it's, the desperation. It's because they, they, they don't want to live like this one more Because day. they think mm -hmm. it's going to last forever right. and they can't escape it. Yeah. Or even my family will be better off without me. Right. Or and a that's person a very who is... Serious, uh, that's yes. a very serious mm -hmm. statement there. My family will be yeah. better yes. off without me. I get really mm -hmm. worried about that, Yes. those mm -hmm. types of statements. So if you hear any... Because they're letting go of those love ties, exactly those right. ties of love. That's right. Mm -hmm. And they, if they actually believe that, you know, I'm thinking they might be psychotic. And psychosis is, of course, a risk factor in suicide exactly. as well. And psychosis is different. Psychosis is hearing voices or having very odd ideas that really don't mm -hmm. register Delusional. with reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Like, you know, I say, well, did you ask your family member? Did they say that you'd really be better off without, you know, that they'd be better off without you? I mean, you know, this is very, that's pretty far down the road as far as delusional right. thinking. A lot I of those think. are really distorted beliefs. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's, yeah. here's some of the others. I can't, I can't mentality. I can't stop the pain. I can't think clearly. Can't eat, can't sleep, right. can't seem to get control. It's right. all about can't, can't, can't. The answer is let us help you learn some tools, mm -hmm. some coping skills where you can. Okay, so this, this is my question. With the warning signs that we've talked about and the symptoms we've talked about, I hear these things. Someone that I love, someone that I know. What do I do next? What do I do now? Because sometimes you say, call 911, do these things. Well, you know, you call 911, you might really upset somebody. And, and I know that that's less, not, that's, I know that's, that's the less of two the evils. <laughs> that's the less of two evils. If but, it has to come to that. But this is playing devil's advocate saying, that's something that somebody might say to themselves. I don't so, want to make them mad. Well, Who listen to them. Listen to them yeah. first, I think, and then be non-judgmental in whatever they have yes. to say. I think that's key. Yeah. You know, try to avoid statements like, look what that would do to your family, yes. or you can't do this, or you'd go to hell, or whatever. Yes. Yes. And, and those kinds of statements generally are not very helpful. Uh, so how do I start is, the conversation? Listening is the how, most helpful how do I do? Thing. Because some people would say that talking about it might even give them ideas. Oh, they already yeah. would have the no, idea. Oh, that's a myth. Right. Okay, yeah. that's a myth. That's okay. one of those myths. We're going to talk some more about some myths, but go ahead and, yeah. and expand on that. Um, you're not going to give them any ideas they don't no. already have. Right. There's no evidence that hearing it makes them do it. Comment on their behavior that is uh, that is making you concerned. You've been concerned, you concerned know. about this. You're not yeah. yourself. So it's okay to talk. I should talk. Yeah, you know, no, I've, yeah I'd say, sure. You say, you know, I've noticed this about, right. you know, and I'm mm -hmm. just concerned about it. And uh, what have you been feeling lately? Mm -hmm. um, and it, is it different with children? And is it different? How, how, do you, how do you approach the children? How do you? It's the same kind of um, discussion. Again, don't be afraid to discuss it with your children. Uh -huh. Don't be afraid to bring it up in case you're seeing any of these warning signs. Uh, just the same as with adults, definitely. Um, I make sure that they know that you've been watching and you care mm -hmm. and that you're paying yeah. attention to how they're thinking and how they're feeling and things like that and that their feelings are important too. I think reassurance that you do care about them yes. is very important in the, the listening and the talking stage. Mm -hmm. It's got to be sincere, I think. Right. Okay, he, here's something then. You said when I see these signs and symptoms, what if I don't? What if I just, am con what if I just, you know, they say, if you don't want your children to do drugs, you need to talk about, you need to talk about drugs to your children. Should I talk to my 13 year old? Should I say these are some things that I've been reading about and learning, even if I don't see any of those, mm -hmm. those warning signs in her? You can find lots of different times to make 
things, teachable moments, and you, you know, little opportunities to be able to discuss this with your children. They're all over the place now, and on, intentionally make those moments. And they might be able to recognize that in a friend. Right. Okay. And bring that concern to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go, Joyce, um, we talked about how to approach the conversation. So the first thing I should say is I've noticed that, you've, that there have been some changes. That would be a good mm -hmm. way to start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've noticed there's been some changes and see what happens mm -hmm. from there. And what you've noticed. And what mm -hmm. I've noticed. And be specific mm -hmm. about those exactly. things. Exactly. And, and, if, and if they clam up and if they withdraw, you can use your personal experience, you know, when yes. in, in the past mm -hmm. when I've been dealing with these things, I know that these are some things that I've been thinking about. What do you think? And mm -hmm. put yourself in there also. I think being persistent, you know, if you notice there is something going on, being persistent in asking the questions and, and, and you know, don't give up. Don't give up because they clam up right then. Because mm -hmm. they may be angry at you. I mean, that may be part of it, mm -hmm. but... Don't, don't give up. Two evils I'd rather have them be angry at me. Than yes. Yeah. I think that clamming up is probably more common in young mm -hmm. than in older, but it can happen. And actually, the, the uncommunicative person is, is a danger sign. Mm -hmm. okay. when you're looking at the warning signs. Right. It's one we had not mentioned previously you know, about that. But that's a concern to when a clinician. That's very much a concern. Yeah. And it, talking about, again, Jennifer, when you talk about, and you're dealing with five to 18 years old, you're dealing with minors. Yes. And you have to talk about that from a counselor's standpoint. I mean, how much can you disclose? Because to parents, I'm not gonna care about your rules. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna care about, you know, the things that you can't tell me because of client privilege. I wanna know what's going on with my child. And parents have the right to know everything that's going on with their children, especially when the child is exhibiting um, ideation, the, the, the idea that this is something that they might be thinking about. The means, they're hiding things, they're hiding knives, they're hiding guns, they're finding things like that. Um, make sure that parents know, oh, your son has a knife under his bed, you know, and he's thinking about using it and, and So those are things the you intent. tell. Those Def are things oh, you definitely. tell. Oh, definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, from a nursing perspective, Connie, um, you're training people like Joyce and people like mm -hmm. Jennifer. Mm -hmm. You're training these people that are going to be trying to help people who are dealing with depression and these, these disorders and the life experiences that have devastated them to where they, they're going to contemplate suicide. How are you training these healthcare providers? What are the types of things that you do as a nursing professor to help? In our program, what we do is have the classroom content on what is depression, uh, the types of depression, go through it basically like the DSM lays it out. Mm -hmm. And um, after learning that, we apply that to case study situations and then um, proceed on to the clinical area where the students go to the inpatient psychiatric unit, they go to the partial adolescent program um, to put in action uh, what they've learned as far as how to assess a patient, uh, what we've been talking about, the warning signs, and generally speaking, every day in the psychiatric unit, that's just part of the basic mental status exam is asking, are you having any suicidal thoughts? But for a student to go to a patient and ask that, it seems odd to them. But I said, that's just like, it is a pain assessment, but it's their, their pain that they're in. So uh, once we get past that, we're okay. But I think as far as uh, then when students graduate, their primary responsibility is in health teaching in the community. I just feel like that's mm -hmm. something that uh, they need to know. Uh, teaching other people signs and symptoms and more importantly, where to go for help. Because many people will come to a nurse, you know, they know you're a nurse, so they'll call you and say, you know, little Johnny is thinking of killing himself. He said some strange things and we don't know what to do. And it's more difficult to seek out those resources mm -hmm. than it is for other medical type resources. Mm -hmm. And our students do a, um, a mental health uh, promotion project. Part of it is in assessing the community that they live in 
for resources. Mm -hmm. And the reason I like for them to do that is so that they do have some knowledge. Number one, how hard it is to find some of the resources. And secondly, uh, what is available in our area. Mm -hmm. And speaking of what's available at the um, Lourdes number for, go ahead and give that okay. if, here locally if you needed to call someone. Yeah. Um, Lourdes number is 444-2250 and that will give you a direct nurse uh, if you need to speak to someone. Give uh, that again please. 444-2250. And then the Forest Behavior Health, they have, there's a 1-800 number, a hotline. That's for? Correct. Um, they can be, the hotline is available at 24 hours a day. They can speak directly to a counselor to discuss if some further um, action is necessary. And it's 1-800-592-3923. Mm -hmm. yeah. 1-800-592-3980. Mm -hmm. And right. those are the local numbers here. And there is, again, that you've seen at the break, 1-800-SUICIDE. Mm -hmm. Um, the 1-800-TALK uh, number um, nationally if you would like to call um, those as well. And um, Tammy, ours is a 24-hour line also. Uh, I would encourage someone, if they were considering that, to please go to your nearest emergency room. Mm -hmm. That is the first step. Someone who's contemplating it then yes. to go to the emergency room. Yes. If it, would you say, this is a fair statement, if you can make it because you said to me many times, they can't, tomorrow is just going to get worse and worse and worse, and they can't stop the pain, and if it's, I'm going to live like this forever, I don't want to live anymore. If you could make it today, if you could make it past today, then that's one more day. Mm -hmm. And if you could get the help today, and try not to worry about tomorrow. And I know maybe, is that, is that too, is it an unfair statement that you can't not worry about tomorrow? I think that they, they may be worrying about tomorrow, but being able to kind of insert some more of those positive thoughts that can overcome some of those automatic negative thoughts that tend to spiral downward to be able to replace some of those will yes. help them be able to get to tomorrow. Yeah, and, and I like your cognitive approach. Uh, one approach yes. is that if someone says, oh, this is intolerable, I can't stand it, is, uh, well, think about, or let's go the next 24 hours and see if you are have intolerable pain for 24 hours straight. And if you do, tell me. But usually what happens is that they do notice that there are times when their pain is less mm -hmm. and sometimes when it's more. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think one part, one important thing about helping people with suicidal uh, ideation or planning is that they, they want to get rid of the pain. Yes. And part of the initial approach is say, pain is real, let's let you help uh -huh. uh, help you how to deal with it mm -hmm. um, let's teach you how to deal with it mm -hmm. teach right. you how teach you how it's a lot of teaching education yes. I think it's a big mm -hmm. issue right now in 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 this area mm -hmm. people even in the you know different places don't know how to respond to someone mm -hmm. they don't know how to you know treat their pain well like I've said we we've come to the end of the show and we were going to do some of the um, fact versus fiction or the myths, but the one that I really wanted to get and just just briefly is If they talk about it don't ignore it. I mean if, if you you can't you can't blow that off You can't just say uh You have to you have to listen to that and what you've mm -hmm. said and reiterated many times is to listen Listen, listen, That's right. and then call. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I really appreciate thank your time you. and I think you've added a lot to the forum today and I've never experienced, I've told you before, the devastation of a loved one or a friend. But I have had people that I know that have opened up to me about losing a loved one. And invariably, you can tell by talking to them that they're changed people. They're not the same. And we want to try to prevent that. We want to try to prevent the suicide Sorry. from happening and touching all those other lives. So please, if you need help, please call 1-800-SUICIDE. Uh, visit the websites that you saw or call the 1-800-592-3980 and get help, please. Join us next time.